Hello, and welcome to another episode of Around the Verse. I'm Chris Roberts. And I'm Dave Haddock. Good to have you on the show, Dave. Thank you. Uh, this week, uh, we have our Star Citizen project update for February. Much like the monthly studio updates, these project updates will include a quick report for the devs, as well as deeper dives into certain aspects of Star Citizen. Yep, and in this month's update, uh, we're actually going to take a look at weapon balancing. But first, let's check in with the developers for a quick update on some of the other things they've been working on for the PU. I'm Todd Pappy, Star Citizen Live Game Director. What we've been focusing on since we released 3.0 and since the start of the year is basically getting the 3.01 patch out as well as focusing on getting all the features that we felt were not up to snuff in 3.0 working on those to complete those, as well as performance optimizations and everything like that. So with 3.0 going out the door, we wanted to focus on what we felt uh, was right and wrong in our development process for that. So in many ways, we've switched our process. Uh, before, we had a lot of kind of, we called it ping-ponging, which was a feature was done in isolation, let's say in LA, and then they needed a UI. So then it was ping-ponged over to the UK, and then from there, the UK UI team might be working on something else for a couple of months, and then it would get thrown back to LA. And so it just wasn't working as a, as a cohesive team as well as development process. So we focused on adjusting the teams and making sure that our teams now are encapsulated and they're seeing a product done from start to finish. Uh, and then also at the same time, we looked at 3.0 and said, hey, we don't think these things are right. Let's fix these. Let's focus on these, including the performance. So with our adjustments to quarterly releases, I, I think this will help the company. It will help um, basically get feedback from the backers sooner than later on features, uh, as well as it will build up a, a cadence um, within our development teams as, as far as getting these releases go going forward, which will help us only in the future. And then at the same time, if a feature is not ready uh, in the past, it was we would we'd actually hold up the build. Um, in this case, if the feature's not ready, it'll just go into the next release or the following release after that. And we'll just continue to work on that feature and make it better and allow it the time that it needs to actually be built up. So with Star Citizen across our five different studios, we have a lot of work going on. However, we'll give you brief updates on 3.01 patch as well as common elements and how those go into building out our environments. Then from there, you'll, we'll talk about the VMA and also character customization being done in LA, as well as the item 2.0 performances. I'm Steve, I'm a production assistant on the live team and I've been helping with the um, creation of a 3.0.1 patch. Um, it came to our attention that there were some very severe issues affecting um, the public at the moment. Um, including a white ball issue where the players would become invisible and then after re-logging they would no longer be able to interact with anything and they'd need a customer service ticket to actually resolve it. Um, so we really needed to get a fix in for that as fast as possible. And when, it, when we realised we were going to be doing a patch, we also realised this was our opportunity to fix up quite a few of the other issues that the community has been talking about and wanting addressed, such as um, problems with the rental system and balance passes on the ship shields, because they were too difficult to destroy. Um, we actually ended up having around 25 issues in total, and most of those have been fixed now. Uh, we were able to push to Evocati at the beginning of this week, and we're just working on finishing a few more of the issues, including the white ball that turned out to be a little bit more difficult than we were expecting. But that one is almost complete now and we're hoping to go this week. In the UK, uh, we're working on the common elements for the hangar at the moment. Um, in this particular case, we're trying to implement this into the truck stop. Um, further down the line, these common elements will be used throughout the PU universe. That's the whole point of them. They're modular and then they can be reused depending on location. At this point in the process, uh, we're working on uh, the white box stage and the white box stage is used for establishing uh, metrics. So basically the measurements uh, that are required in order to make this modular in this case. So they can also be placed inside uh, space stations. Um, they, 
we were trying to intend they used to be on planets as well. So respectively for space stations, we could have uh, like front loaders. So the door, you just fly straight into the hangar for like planets we're planning or maybe landing through the top. Um, and hangars will come in several sizes. So we're gonna have like quite small hangars. We're also gonna have giant like extra large hangars. So the weapons team has been very busy at the moment, working on a lot of different stuff. Um, uh, one of the weapons we've been working on is the new Gemini R97 shotgun. Um, and this is kind of working towards what we're trying to accomplish at the moment, where we're really trying to fill out the weapon selection that people have got at the moment, because it's currently reasonably limited. We want to just keep getting more manufacturers out there more different weapon types out there, more different damage types out there to provide people with a nice selection of weapons to pick from. They can pick their favorites and use the ones they feel are most effective. Uh, so that's, um, it can be seen quite easily in the R97 shotgun because we've got the Devastator out at the moment that fires big bursts of plasma damage. You can pick between your normal shotgun blast so you can pick between your charge mode. Uh, but that very much concentrates on raw damage. It's a very rough and ready looking weapon as well. Whereas the, the new Gemini shotgun is very clean looking. It's more traditional than it fires normal ballistic rounds. And it's very, very versatile. Uh, you can pick between a tighter spread or a looser spread. So you can pick a fire mode that's more suited towards longer corridors, or you can pick one that's much more suited to closer, close encounters. The UK team over here have been working on the VMA and the PMA, which are the vehicle manager and the personal manager. Um, ever since 3.0, we've, we've still got a few bugs that need fixing and a few features that need improving, so our focus is, is largely on that. We spoke to the community earlier in the month and we got a lot of their feedback and we've added that to our own internal feedback of what did and didn't work. So we've got a roadmap now of, of where we want to take that system. Um, so for the first sprint, we're focusing on the vehicle side of things. Um, bringing that all in line with how the, the personal system works as well. So any fixes we put in for the vehicle system will also knock on and affect the personal system. So it's mainly bug fixes at the moment, but our UI side, Zane and art director Ian Leyland are working on a new uh, front side uh, for how it looks. So it's the user interface and the user experience should improve. Um, and then hopefully we'll be able to get some more features in as those systems come online. Uh, the uh, gameplay features team has been working on the character customizer, um, which allow players to customize their characters so that they can uh, manage the way they look as they uh, go around the PU. Uh, the first iteration of the character customizer is going to allow players to change their uh, head, the skin tone, uh, their eye color, the, um, their hairstyle, and their hair color. Um, we're still working on the details about um, exactly when they're allowed to uh, and how many times they're allowed to customize their character. Um, and, uh, but those changes will be persistent, so uh, when you make those changes, every time you log in to Star Citizen, uh, you'll look the way you want. Uh, we're also working on um, deciding exactly um, which uh, of the different uh, uh, items that you can change are going to be entitled to the, to the players. Uh, but we'll iron out those details before we release 3.1. Mostly, like on my side, I've been just converting, like taking the work that the engineers did to optimize it, and then I have to convert all the items like the, the gimbals, the turrets, the missile racks, the EMP, and just like converting it to our DataForge system because it used to be just in a, a raw data system, and now we have to actually convert it into DataForge so it can take advantage of the optimizations in the item 2.0 system. And I've been helping Hosmer with uh, optimizing the game. So basically what I do is I converted all the old items into, the, or some of the old items into a, the new item 2.0 system, which takes advantage of batch updates and a few uh, update calling and some of the other optimization that we put in over the last couple months. The idea is that the reason why we did this was because a lot of the items that we used to have updated on the main main thread, which it is, which does, which does networking, which does the UI, which does some gameplay logic, and if all of these, and then if all of these ha things happen on the main thread, everything cr crawls really slowly because you have, we have planets to deal with, we have ships to deal with, we have players to deal with, and a whole bunch, of, every all of them have their own hundreds if not thousands of items. And so now with the new item 2.0 system we get to have, we get to spin off uh, other threads to deal with these logics. 
and then let the main thread only deal with uh, the essentials like networking or with UI updates and stuff like that. In the future, we hope to have uh, additional optimizations like network calling or in-range calling where we might we won't update an item if they're too far away from the player, or if the network is being really slow, we can probably skip some of the messages that get sent along, and then just use the latest information that we got from either the client or the server. And then, who knows, maybe we'll have some more optimizations that we can't even think about. Thanks, guys. Now, uh, we're going to take a look at how the devs have been balancing the various weapons, whether they're ships or FPS ones that you'll find in the game. Yeah, and it's always a bit of a challenge. And I know it's ongoing debate on the <laughs> forums all the time. And yeah. I'm sure it'll be like that until we're done and even after we're done. Right. Um, uh, but in this feature, we'll get some details on the evolving combat experience in Star Citizen. So let's take a look. So weapon balance is, as, as the name implies, it's the balancing of the weapons, both ship and FPS. They, because the, the game is one fluid scene between both, they, they do sort of impact on each other a little. But it's just part of the whole balance cycle. We have shields, health, armor, uh, item components, weapons, flight, and they all blend together into the whole balance uh, scene. And they all impact on each other. and problems from one knock onto the other so it's not always immediately clear where issues are but generally we start with weapons as that's the thing that people pick up on first as it's what they do the most of is shooting each other and shooting at things so that's where the problems first arise. Ship weapon balancing I suppose is uh, the work I do to make sure that no weapon is overpowered and no weapon is underpowered and, and all the parameters that we decide um, you want to make sure that each weapon type, say the scatter gun, is uh, relatively balanced towards a cannon weapon type or, I don't know, a hypothetical beam cannon type. So the scatter gun will do more damage than a regular cannon, but obviously its rate of fire is slower. And we just make sure that all these parameters fit in the correct range that we give them on a per size basis and that nothing is too strong or too weak. Well, the, the reason we need ship weapon balance um, is to make the game fun and competitive. If, if we allow situations to persist where we've got a, a gun that's too strong, you'll find that the player base will all use that weapon and it'll just it'll become a very uh, samey game. Everyone's using the same weapons, same tactics. We want to prevent that by having as much variation, but without allowing there to be one sort of king weapon that, that rules every other weapon. It's, it's really a, 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 in the interest of gameplay that we you know, strive to keep things as balanced as possible. At the moment, I'm working on updates to the 3.0 stream. We're looking to do a, a short patch that does some balance work um, based on feedback from what's currently live. Uh, mainly I was looking at shields and weapons, but you know these things are all connected and they all determine each other. So when I'm looking at the shield health, I want to make sure that it's not too strong or too weak based on the weapons that we have. So weapon damage is a big part of what I'm doing at the moment. Because the shields have been reworked for item 2.0 and there's now different uh, characteristics involved. So with that change, we have to make sure that so, you know, repeater weapons have a rate of fire that isn't too high to knock these shields down too quickly. I've been working towards uh, taking what we've got, like parameters that are in game that determine rate of fire, damage, weapon spread, boil those into I don't know, certain numbers that we can then show maybe as bars or just as an overall score to kind of allow players to pick the best weapon for their situation much, much easier. Because right now, you don't get that. You just have to pick a weapon, play with it a bit, and then, and then work it out for yourself. So to try and get these numbers, these stats, I'm kind of going all the way back to, to rework how uh, we scale weapon damage and all the parameters, in fact. When we make changes to ship movement, the effects on weapons, the effects on targeting, it all ripples down. So we, we sort of see these problems, and we can say, that's going to be a problem soon. 
we need the time to look at it. Sometimes things go out a bit before we're fully happy with them, but that's kind of the nature of what we're doing development-wise. You have to predict these problems, and then when we get time to fix them, we can. Um, so for 3.1, it'll be like looking at those problems that we've seen and the community have obviously encountered, and then we get time to fix them. When that's weapons, when that's ship movement, it's all connected. So I'm hoping to do weapons, uh, we review shields, armor, ship health, they're all kind of in flux. For the longest time, pretty much since the game first came out, all the ships had the same armor values and their toughness was determined like in their health. We decided that was incorrect. So what we've done is we've um, changed it so the health of the ship is only determined by how big the ship is and the armor is now how tough the ship is. So we scaled the armor with civilian ships and racers and cargo and military ships. There's, a, there's an actual armor scale to it now rather than just bigger ships have more, like exponentially more health, which was getting unmanageable. So we can control the ship health a lot easier now. We started doing it like at the end after doing the health balancing. And what we did was we took the health down and put the armor on. So even though there's less health, it still takes roughly the same amount of time to kill the ships and then shields on top of that. It's, it's kind of near the end of the ship pipeline once we've, because we can't really play test the ships when they're half built. So we have to wait for them to be done and then get all the actual tech um, balance working. The way uh, armor works, it's a multiplier on the damage the ship's taking. Like we gave the civilian armors a multiplier of like 0.9 so that times is the damage by 0.9, so that lessens it a bit, but military ships would have 0.7 or 0.6, so they would take less damage overall. So even if the ships, the Gladius and say the uh, 300, they're roughly the same size with the same amount of health, but the Gladius will take more hits because it's got better armor on. That's, we prefer to have that rather than just giving the Gladius like an extra 3000 health, because it's tidier at the end of the day. It also lets us swap armor around if we need to. There's pirates in the PU that are supposed to be weaker than player ships. So instead of giving them less health, which requires like an entirely separate ship, we can have the same ship the player has and just fit a weaker version of the armor to it. So that saves space. And when we need to update the ship, we don't have to update each version of the ship as well. We can just update the ship and then the armor will be fine for all the different varieties of it. Going by what we've got on the website, we separated each ship out into its category. So you've got civilian ships like the Auroras and the um, uh, 300s, and you've got the racers like the M50, combat ships like Gladius and other things, and the cargo ships like the Freelancer. We all, they were put into groups and they were given base armor values, which were then modified by the size of the ship in question. So the M50 now has quite weak armor compared to the other ships. Because it's a racer, it would have thin armor to allow it to go faster. That was just how the, that was the, uh, where we got the baseline for each armor type for. And then further uh, iterated it from there. Because while the Hornet and the Super Hornet are the same size and the same military combat ship, the Super Hornet does have tougher armor than the regular one. So there are separate armor values for each ship. They just belong to a group of armor type now. The other reason we did this was to have armor also um, determine missile locks on ships. So for, this is only really done so far with the, uh, the Hornet Ghost, which, has, which is more difficult for missiles to lock onto, we've put those values in its armor. So it has stealth, prop, actual stealth armor now, rather than just being something we say it has. Um, so we can do that with other ships. So we can now give proper variant armors. So if you want your regular Hornet to be stealthy, you can swap its good armor off, put some stealth armor on. It might be slightly, slightly weaker, but it will have better um, attributes for dealing with missiles. Sometimes there will be, Unpredictable things, um, say like th there's an AI ship in the PU that we've not really been paying close attention to, but they've used it in a story or a mission and it's time to kill is way too high, but it's like, yeah, you've picked a, a super powerful ship. 
sometimes that happens, you know, sometimes people want certain characteristics from certain things that maybe they weren't designed for, it does happen. Um, we have to react to that and um, there are ways to like just change the items on the ship or to make it, make modifiers present to make the ship weaker or to make the ship stronger. So all things you have to react to. So when we get reports of issues or things we find when we're testing ourselves and playing internally, uh, we have to sort of go through a few steps to work out whether it's actually a valid issue, uh, whether it's valid for weapon balance or whether it's something from another area, or what, in some cases it's something that players have been exploiting for a long time um, that we never intended them to do. And we fixed it thinking that no one's been doing that and immediately people go, well, this, does, this doesn't work how it used to work before. Something's broken when in fact it's actually behaving how it's supposed to behave. So yeah, we, we go through it all um, and see where everything blends together like a, a common one. People say oh, the weapons don't feel like they're doing enough damage and aside from the weapons perhaps not doing enough damage, that is quite often from network desync. Um, your pips are on something. As a client, you feel you should be hitting them, but somewhere between the client and the server, it goes slightly amiss, and then suddenly you're not hitting anything. You feel, as a player, that you should be hitting them. You're not. Your, your first instinct is to go, well, the weapons are, are wrong. Um, and there's tons and tons of other scenarios like that uh, where it's something else that's actually causing the issue um, rather than the weapons, but it always comes to us first to, to sort of identify where that problem is. So we, we investigate the issues. Um, first cause is always look at the weapons because that's something we can very quickly work out. It's, it's all uh, in spreadsheets so we know how, how accurate things should be at certain ranges, how much damage they put out, how, how long the time to kill on uh, various combinations of ships with shields up, shields down. So we have the, the perfect paper number and if it is not close to that then we know something else is wrong. That could be as simple as someone's just put the wrong number in the, the XML, put a decimal point in the wrong place. Uh, and if it's not that simple, then it's starting to go through all the other areas of the game to work out where where's it not lining up. Is it the shields are too strong? The shields themselves have so many values that it could be any number of them. If it's not the shields, is it the armor? Is it, if it's not the armor, is it the health? If it's not the health, is it perhaps the way ships are flying? Perhaps they're something's happened in the flight handling that they're now a bit twitchier that as the person doing the damage you don't notice at that distance. And then we go through all the, the various code disciplines to work out perhaps there's just some underlying bug in the code that only uh, appears in multiplayer. Perhaps it's the network again, perhaps it's the UI. Uh, we've had times where the pips, uh, they look like they're doing the right thing but they're in fact completely off. Um, and all these sort of things we have to go through and isolate and work out where the problem lies. At the end of the day, we want everyone to have uh, a good fight with the weapons. It's got to feel, it's got to sound, it's got to look good shooting people. Um, and some of, some of that is not from design numbers that we're tweaking. It could be uh, the, v the VFX of the, the hits just aren't rendering at a certain distance. So again, you think you, you're not hitting, but you are. Um, the audio might not be working and it, as designers and working on the balance it's about bringing the entire experience together from all those disciplines. Much like the ship setup pipeline, the, the designers are, at the end of the day they're the ones that bring it all together and then continue to monitor it and work on it well after release. I think over time the, 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 the process has changed because we've done a lot of work to change how weapons and items all work from the code level. So now that we've transported things or ported things over to use DataForge a lot more, that does make my life easier. You've got parameters that are in a, um, in a tool that doesn't let me typo things. Uh, that does happen, you know. I've, I've been told quite a few typos. They do creep into the game, but that's because we, as designers, were, were left to just hand edit stuff. And, problems that creates. Sometimes they're tiny, sometimes they're quite major. Nothing super massive, but they are noticeable. So having things locked into records that we uh, edit in a tool makes life a lot safer, a lot less stressful. Um, but like fundamentally with the 
how you think about balancing the weapons. That I would say that hasn't changed, uh, only that maybe I've changed because I'm new to it. So like it's been done before, but I'll come to it maybe with fresh ideas. Maybe when you talk to other people, they've got certain ideas, especially when you talk to uh, system designers that have certain wants and needs for uh, what you're trying to do. It all kind of influences. We've been doing this a long time, so it's it's difficult to not be influenced by other people's opinions and how that should work. So I'd say the, the process hasn't altered that much, but you know, you're always listening to new ideas that might affect how this works. Balance is never ending. We're always looking for more ways for it to, to feel better, to, to work in synergy with the other areas of the game. Um, we've got more weapon types coming that do specific features. So in 3.0, it's pretty much just uh, ballistic or physical energy, energy and distortion are the three main types, but in the future we're going to be expanding that to about four or five. So then there'll be the whole play with those different energy types, how they work on different ships, how they work on different items, just to try and get people mixing stuff up a little. It's not We don't want to have that one great loadout for each ship that is the best at everything. We want people to constantly be mixing and matching what they're doing for their encounters that they're expecting to have and sort of putting more thought into how they play rather than oh, so-and-so plays with four of these and he gets everything with it. We don't want that to necessarily be the end game. We want it to suit how you play. It's, it's never finished and never satisfied. There's always more we can do. Some really cool stuff there. Remember, you can follow Star Citizen's development uh, with our new roadmap to track updates on new features and up and coming content for Star Citizen's persistent universe. Uh, check out the link uh, in the video description below if uh, you uh, want to go and check out our roadmap. And that's it for this week. Uh, Reverse to Verse Live airs early again tomorrow at 9 a.m. Pacific uh, with guests Andy Nicholson and John Crew from the design team. Uh, I assume talking about. Yeah, I'm pretty sure thing. they will. So you have a whole hour to grill them about the questions that were probably raised by the piece you just saw. Uh, and make sure to check out the new episodes of Calling All Devs, which is, I think, going over very well. So mm -hmm. Jared's been doing a great job on that. And uh, the old stalwart, Lawmaker's Guide to the Galaxy, yeah. by yeah. Dave and the rest of the writing team, uh, that uh, aired earlier this week. A big thank you, of course, to our subscribers for sponsoring shows like this and all of our other ones. Yes, definitely. Thank you. And of course, thank you to all our backers. Your support lets us continue to make Star Citizen and Squadron 42 the best games they can be. So thank you very much. Until next week, we'll see you around the bus. watching so if you want to keep up with the latest and greatest in Star Citizen and Squadron 42's development please follow us on our social media channels see you soon